Yutaka Nakamura, Chikashi Kabota, Yoshimichi Kamada, Arafumi Yamai, Bahi JD. If you were like some rando Sakuga fan back in 2015 and were wondering, hey, I wonder what would happen if all the best action animators got together? Well, One Punch Man would be that show. With the best of the best gathered together, how could it not be? But how did we get here? Was it budget? Well, according to character designer Chikashi Kabota, he said the show had quite an average one. So was it then thanks to Studio Madhouse's incredible animators? Well, none of the animators mentioned were Madhouse employees either, and a lot of the top moments on the show came from freelancers and guys just from different studios. So why was the animation then so good? Well, it was quite literally because of this show. Yep, not much to look at on first glance, but don't let its wild comedy deceive you. Space Dandy was 2014's One Punch Man in a sense. Perhaps not in terms of popularity, but simply incredible animation. And it was created by many of the same names. Nakamura, Kabota, Kamada, Bahi, and many others that would go on to work on One Punch Man. But there is one figure that I haven't mentioned, the mystery man and very much the godfather, the architect and, well, I guess just simply the first step to getting our answer, Shingo Natsume. If you've been struggling to remember all the names mentioned, just make sure this is one you don't. And what's interesting is that the dude had never even directed an anime before, but being able to work alongside other incredible creators and one of the most important of them all, the man behind Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo, Shinichiro Watanabe, he was in the perfect environment to foster his talent. And listen closely to what I say here as I think you'll quickly begin to see the parallels between these two. Watanabe's vision for the tale of Pompadour Man was really something else. Realizing that a lot of anime at the time had been looking not all that different from each other, Watanabe wanted to show that would give creators an opportunity to better express themselves. To put it simply, he wanted to flip the standard anime formula on its head. A core team of directors, scriptwriters, and animation supervisors that rotate between episodes? Nope. Instead, each episode would feature a completely different group working together, leading to 20 episode directors, 10 scriptwriters, 23 animation supervisors, and the list goes on. A single composer for the soundtrack? No again. Watanabe would ask 20 different artists to submit several tracks for the show. You got rap, jazz, funk. Simply put, the core theme was creative freedom. And that seemed to have rubbed off on our man Natsume. Bahi JD notes that the freedom the animators had wasn't just thanks to Watanabe, but Natsume as well. Regardless, his time on Space Dandy would create three factors that would lead to One Punch Man looking so good and sort of coming to exist in a sense. The first would be Natsume's trip to the United States. Shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of otakus, he had the opportunity to watch this wild show with an audience. I really hope it wasn't this one. And this was actually pretty handy. It gave him the chance to see what part of the script clicked and what didn't. But most of all, this whole experience seemed to have made an impression, like a really big one, going to the extent to note it as a major influence in defining the image of One Punch Man and seemed to give confidence to many of the higher ups to get the series underway. The second was experience. Not only would Natsume have experience in the director role now going into One Punch Man, but he just came from a show where he was constantly getting to work with new creators, being able to see their workflow firsthand. The third, and arguably the second biggest, connections. Like anything where a group of people come together, such as work, sports, school pro- actually might leave that one out, no bonds were formed there. You build relationships with those around you, and he very much did. Generally, everyone just seemed to have had a really great time on Space Dandy thanks to the vision of both Watanabe and Natsume. And so when it would be announced that Natsume would be heading up One Punch Man, well, many of those skilled animators were eager to join him and do it all again. For example, when it came to selecting a character designer, Chikashi Kabota was the first name that popped up into Natsume's head. The thing is, Kabota at first was a little anxious about the position as he questioned himself if he could do justice to Yusuke Murata's work. But with such an opportunity to team up with good old Natsumi again, well, it's an offer that was hard to refuse. And I'm sure that's a similar story for many others. It wasn't just Natsumi's wide range of connections with freelancers and animators from different studios, but it was more so that environment he helped foster on Space Dandy of freedom and expression that made One Punch Man a desirable project to work on. And this aspect of Natsume, even though he's continued to evolve since One Punch Man, one thing that hasn't changed is that whatever project he's on, he always seems to attract talented people to him. Connections are key in the industry, and Natsume is a defining example of one who has many. But let's stop right there. 
Now we know why many of these great animators came to the show, but what did they bring? Well, first up is one of the industry's best, Yutaka Nakamura. The simplest way to describe his work is cinematic. Nakamura typically storyboards most of his work, not exactly a privilege given to everyone, although gives him the ability to achieve such a vision. Everything is composed in a way to emphasize big impacts rather than nuance. For example, we have this scene as Saitama takes on Lord Boros. When parts of the spaceship disintegrate, there are hundreds of pieces of debris breaking apart, although he holds on the moment briefly for the audience to take it in and deliver that wow factor. And he also does the same for the big explosion right after, but with an even longer hold this time. Or as Boros lands a knee into Saitama, there's a burst of about 14 impact frames and like lens flares are everywhere. It's bold and in your face, which always leaves this strong impression. Although in Nakamura's case, we also have to give props to one of Madhouse's producers for bringing him on. Still, I have no doubt that working under Natsumi before also helped in a bit of that persuasion. Then there is Yoshimichi Kamada, coincidentally who is also known for his beautiful impact frames, heavily inspired by legendary animator Yoshinori Kanada, as well as Nakamura. His focus is intensity, expressed through his use of spacing and timing, Characters' actions are powerful and forceful, while the drawings are illustrated with bold, rough line work, also reminiscent of Kanada's early work and other top animators from that era like Shingo Araki. It's a stylistic detail that pairs together to achieve expressivity and power. Kanada brings a blend of old and new to the table and is definitely one of my favorites on the show. And while we're talking about Kanada and Kanada, there's someone inspired by both, Toshi Yuki Sato. Of course, he embraces white spacing in his animation and loves those rough lines that bring energy and fun to his work. Thereafter, there's Arafumi Yamai, Attack on Titan's top action animator, and who very much defined the style of it to that show. Of course, Amai loves some crazy complex camera work, and that's definitely a feature of his work here, making for some incredible action sequences. Although, unlike his work on Attack on Titan, he heavily uses smears which pair well with the timing giving a feeling of fluidity to certain movements in his work, and particularly when there are long holds on an action. Now, besides working as a way to emphasize a moment, they also give time for an audience to breathe after all the visual information they've taken in. But Amai doesn't want to compromise on that sense of motion, and again, attempts to give a burst of fluidity to those moments. There's also Gosei Oda, a very idiosyncratic animator. On Space Dandy, he would love to stretch characters' bodies with a heavy emphasis on exaggeration above all else. And much like on Space Dandy, he's pretty involved here. You might be wondering how a style like that would work with a show like One Punch Man, but it does. One of the best examples is episode 1. You definitely can see that sense of exaggeration still present, however it works perfectly in giving this strong sense of energy with these forceful poses that give a lot of strength to the character's actions. Now moving on, there are of course many other Space Dandy staff crossovers, as well as newcomers both young and old. An example is Katsuyoshi Nikatsuru, a big name on the Digimon franchise as well as on Dragon Ball, and well known on both for his character design work and particularly being the man behind the design of Super Saiyan 4, made an appearance in Episode 1. Or there's Zen Miso, the incredible freelancer, who left quite a mark on My Hero Academia and a regular on Mob Psycho, and more recently delivered some incredible work on Ranking of Kings, made his way to the show, and thankfully also being a regular on it as well. There are definitely many more names to mention as I said, but I think we got the answer as to why One Punch Man's animation was so good. So if you enjoyed the video, you know, yeah, do that thing. And if the video does well, I might do a follow up on why the animation for One Punch Man season two was so mediocre and just go through several of the unfortunate production troubles they had. Also, shout out to the new patrons, Dant and Sayid. Thank you very much for that, guys. But yeah, thank you all and I'll see you later.